Membership card. This is to certify that Sergeant A. Joyce has qualified as a member of the Goldfish Club by escaping death by the use of his emergency dinghy on September the 3rd, 1943. What a weird little card and official looking badge that went along with it. An interesting way to mark a story that was both compelling and terrifying. My father was 16 when the Second World War broke out in Europe, and as was common in Canada at the time, he signed up for military service as soon as he turned 18. Within a few months, he was transferred to England, where he became a navigator on the incredibly ungainly Ferry Albacore, a single-engine biplane torpedo bomber. Later, he was transferred to the Royal Canadian Air Force 422nd Tomahawk Squadron, where he was assigned as navigator on the Sunderland Flying Boats. The Sunderlands were an impressive aircraft, used during the war for long-range reconnaissance and anti-submarine warfare. They had four engines and were designed to take off and land only in the water. And if you're thinking right now, four engines can land in the water, what could possibly go wrong? Well, stay tuned. The plane's maximum range was over 4,000 kilometers, and they could be in the air up to 14 hours at a time. The crew ranged from seven to 12 men, and because of the long mission duration, basically comprised two shifts. There were bunks and a wardroom for resting, a toilet, and even a small galley for preparing meals. This was a big plane. Defensive armament varied by the aircraft model, but usually consisted of two machine gun turrets, one on the nose and one on the tail, plus machine gun hatches. Depending on the mission, the aircraft could attack with bombs or depth charges. These armaments were stored inside the hull and winched out along racks through hatches under the wings and then released remotely. As navigator, my father's station was located at this window with a chart table and various instruments jammed into the small area. Remember, this was long before GPS so navigation, particularly over the featureless ocean, was incredibly difficult, requiring dead reckoning, observations of drifts on the water surface to determine wind speed and directional corrections. There was an astrodome at the top for taking readings from the sun or stars. It's hard to imagine in this day and age that kind of navigation. The 422nd Sunderland Squadron was based in Northern Ireland, and because the adjacent Ireland remained neutral during the war, it could not be flown over. As a result, their missions often needed to follow a circuitous route just to reach their patrol area in various parts of the North Atlantic. On Friday, September the 3rd, 1943, my father's flying boat was on an anti-submarine patrol over the Bay of Biscay, northwest of Spain, and about 1,200 kilometers from base. Dad, just 20 years old at the time, was at his navigation post. The pilot, a French-born American named Jacques de la Paul, was in command. In total, there were 12 on board, five Canadians, five British, and two Americans. Apparently, these mixed nationalities were common in these large aircraft. A bit before 9 a.m., the crew was shaken by a loud bang from the right side. The outboard engine had backfired and flames were visible, shooting out from the bottom. Moments later, a huge explosion rocked the aircraft as a fuel tank caught fire. My dad saw the engine hang briefly from the wing, then fall away in entirely, taking over half the wing with it. The inboard engine's fuel supply was cut, that engine failed, and the craft was doomed. The radio man, Earl Hiscox, managed to get three SOS calls out, while De La Paul and co-pilot Romeo Freer somehow kept control sufficiently to circle and bring the Sunderland into a somewhat controlled crash into the sea. Badly damaged, but at least upright. Water was flooding in from the nose as the men scrambled to escape. There were two inflatable dinghies stored near the rear side door. 
On his way to the back, my father was credited with taking the time to tear electrical fuse wires away from the depth charges, as they may have exploded when the plane sunk. My dad and one of the wireless operators, Bill Holroyd, managed to get the first dinghy out the back door, but by this time, the water was waist deep in the lower sections of the plane. Seven men made it out. The remaining crew, including De La Paul, dragged the second dinghy up through the ship and managed to escape through the Astrodome hatch. They threw the dinghy into the water and jumped for their lives. As luck would have it, the second dinghy was torn on some jagged metal during the narrow escape. So all 12 men scrambled into or clung to the sides of the one intact inflatable. The aircraft sunk within two minutes of hitting the water. Miraculously, other than some cuts and scratches, all 12 men were alive and well. They quickly managed to patch the second dinghy and inflate it with a hand pump, lash the two together and take stock of their situation. The weather was fair, so they managed to dry their clothes over the course of the day and spirits were high. Unfortunately, they had lost part of their emergency ration pack when the dinghy ripped so the skipper ordered strict conservation of food and water. They all went entirely without water the first day. Subsequent days, their daily ration was one tablespoon of water, one piece of chewing gum, and one malted milk tablet for each of breakfast, lunch, and dinner. The plan was to make their rations last 12 days. There was no plan B. As night fell, they deployed a spray sheet to keep warm and dry. But soon the wind came up, it began to rain, and waves were coming over the sides of the dinghies. Soaked to the skin once again, it was not a great first night. The next day they erected a makeshift sail, tied their May West life vests together to act as a drogue to steady the wildly rocking boats, and hoped for the best. They knew pretty well where they were, and felt they could reach the coast of Portugal nearly 300 kilometers away if they weren't rescued by air. Spain was closer, but was German occupied. Portugal, at least, was neutral. Over the next two days, they saw seven aircraft pass nearby. They fired off flares, but were not spotted. Meanwhile, at home, parents received sad telegraph messages. Regret to advise that your son, Sergeant Arthur Walter Thomas Joyce, is reported missing after air operations overseas. At times the wind and waves were so strong they had to hold the two dinghies together by hand for fear that the ropes would tear the rubber lugs out and sink the inflatables. They also frequently spotted sharks circling the dinghies. It doesn't sound fun. In the late afternoon of the fourth day in the water, an American Liberator bomber flew right overhead at low altitude and signaled the lost men. The air crew dropped a bag with some supplies, a dozen oranges, three packs of cigarettes, and a note that read, don't go away, help is on its way. An hour later, an RAF Sunderland arrived, but by this time there was a very heavy swell and landing would be perilous. It took two attempts to manage a landing in the large waves. They taxied the plane closer to the dinghies and one of the crew swam over with a rope, despite the presence of at least one shark circling nearby. As the dinghies were pulled to the plane, someone took the time to snap a couple of pictures on their phone. Okay, well, not on their phone, but anyway, the arrow points to my father. You can really appreciate the small size of the two dinghies in this shot. Yeah, that's both dinghies but their troubles were still not over. When the rescue Sunderland attempted to take off, it was bounced 50 feet into the air by a heavy swell, sunk back down, skimmed the water, and finally got airborne with an airspeed of only 60 knots. The rescue had almost ended in tragedy. The 12 men enjoyed a brief rest once they reached solid ground, but were soon back in the air flying similar missions once again. The camaraderie gained during those terrifying days in the sea remained long after the war as the men returned to their distant homes and families. The friends kept in touch by mail, 
often exchanging newfound stories, such as details of the crew that rescued them. My father kept a box of treasures from the experience, including a ration tin, his rain hat, maps, and a compass. I'll do another video one day about those things. It's pretty interesting stuff. Dad passed away in 2004 and would have been 98 this year. I think you would have enjoyed this video, and I hope you did too. His story is captured briefly in this book, The RCAF Overseas, and is one of countless tales of brave men and women fighting to preserve our freedom. Lest we forget.